Welcome everybody. Welcome to the third The Promise of the Negev Soroka Salon session. We have amazing uh, guests with us today and of course our beloved host Professor Michael Barzohar who is also the biographer of Ben Gurion uh, biography and other books and uh, author, historian, politician, and also now a candidate for the president of Israel. So we're welcome everybody. And to introduce everyone today, our special guest, I would like to welcome uh, Rachel Heisler, executive director of American Friends of Soroka Medical Center. Rachel. Thank you, Pazit. Pazit Levitan. She is the Director of Development for American Friends of Soroka. And now a warm welcome to Professor Michael Barzohar, who is the host and guide on today's multi-layered exploration of the promise of the Negev. He is a man of great distinction in politics, history, and as an author. We are so fortunate for his friendship and we share his deep passion for David Ben-Gurion for the Negev and Israeli innovation. Thank you, Michael. And Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome, and we hope soon we'll be able to call you Mr. President. Um, I am honored to welcome you, sure. you here today. Those of you who are joining a Soroka Salon for the first time, we are delighted to meet you. We have spectacular guests with us today, both of whom represent the synthesis of the pioneering spirit of the Negev, its high impact innovation, and respect for and devotion to the diverse communities comprising the area. Professor Ohad Burke is the head of the Genetics Institute at Soroka Medical Center, as well as the head of the National Research Center for Rare Diseases and the head of the Maris Khan Laboratory of Human Genetics at Ben Gurion University, right across the street from Soroka. A former fellow of the NIH, Professor Burke leads a massive clinical genetic screening and prevention program. He has decoded 40 rare genetic diseases thereby alleviating immense human suffering. He is known for his groundbreaking work in both the Sephardic and Bedouin genetic diseases. His work has led to approximately 30% reduction amongst the Negev Bedouin and prevention of PCCA and PCCA2 diseases in Jews. Along the way to achieving his breakthroughs in Bedouin health through genetics, he had the unusual opportunity to participate in a public debate on the topic on Al Jazeera. He won. In this historic event, Professor Burke scored a home run in public education. He is revered by the Bedouin sheiks of the Negev. As you can see in this photo that I took of Dr. Burke in the Knesset in Jerusalem at a Soroka event, he enjoys a warm relationship with the Bedouin population. He is widely known and respected for his work, and he is sought out by Sephardic communities all around the world to help decipher genetic mysteries. We are so proud of you, Ohad, and thank you. Professor Victor Novak is the head of the Research Authority and Clinical Research Center at Soroka Medical Center, where he also heads the internal medicine department. He is a professor of medicine and a clinical epidemiologist at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. At the last salon, Victor introduced us to his research. He's the director of the Soroka Ben Gurion Research Institute and an expert in innovation in the service of saving lives. The Research Institute is an extremely important collaboration between Soroka and Ben Gurion University right across the street and it includes the Nega Biobank, a state-of-the-art repository for biospecimens. It's the first large-scale population-based biological archive in Israel and unique for its layer of environmental impact. Professor Novak is also an adjunct professor and senior researcher in the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Management at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Victor is distinguished by his human touch. He never loses sight of the fragility of life and his responsibility to Soroka's extremely diverse patients and the opportunity that he has by guiding and developing research projects to help improve outcomes. Case in point, his recent work with cannabis. Thank you, Victor. We are very proud to host you here today. And 
Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you to the American Friends of Soroka Board for your commitment to Soroka and our life-saving mission. And especially to Pazit Levitan, our Director of Development, and to Executive Committee member Deborah Cherky for spearheading our Soroka Salon series, helping to create such a warm virtual environment where Soroka friends can gather to learn together and enjoy an extraordinary conversation. Thank you. And now back to Pazit. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that warm introduction. And just to recall, the first session we had, which you can view on soroka.org, we talked about the history. Professor Barzot talked about the early days of the Negev with Ambassador Devon. Then the second uh, session we had, we talked about the outburst of the innovation in high tech. Now we are talking, going deeper and talking about the research, groundbreaking research and its impact both nationally, strategically to Israel and globally. We're going to talk also about the diversity and um, genetic based uh, breakthroughs. So uh, here's to you, Professor Barzar, to take it from now on. Okay, good evening. <laughs> I want to talk, talk, talk to you about research and diversity from a totally different point of view. Of course, I'm going back to my mentor, David ben -Gurion. When he came to Palestine, it was 1906. <coughs> there were about 60,000 Jews in Palestine and lots of Arabs. So at the beginning, ben Gurion decided to make a research about those Arabs whom we met in the villages in, in Palestine and in the Negev. And he reached the conclusion. He said, all these fella, all these farmers, all these peasants, they are all Jewish, but they stayed in the land of Israel after the Jewish people were exiled. They stayed because they wanted to keep their land. But, and they took the Muslim flag, yes, but they're still, they are former Jews. Well, that did not work very much because nobody, nobody accepted this kind of theory. So when the state of Israel was created, he had another idea. He said, let's convert the Bedouins of the Negev to Judaism. Let's make them Jews. He created a special unit in the army, which went to the Negev to convert the Bedouins into Judaism. After a year, he called the head of the unit. He said, well, did you succeed? The guy said, well, not exactly. He said, how many did you convert? He said, eight. So we couldn't understood that also in this field, there was no solution. So the question remained, how do we live side by side with the Bedouins, who today are also a major part in the economy of Beersheba and the Negev? and of course, in the medical body and in the patient of Soroka. Now, this is a kind of two-edged sword. On one hand, we have wonderful, wonderful examples of Bedouins who have become members of parliament, who have become writers, reporters, doctors, they have doctors in, in Soroka, uh, of course, nurses, wonderful people. And we believe that especially the women in the Bedouin tribes are going to bring their families and their communities into the 21st century. On the other hand, we have a problem. Today, there are about 300, about 300,000 more, more or less, uh, 300,000 of Bedouins in the north of the Negev around Beersheba. Some of them live in cities, in towns which, we, which have been brought like Rahat, the big town of 70,000 people. Many of them live in the desert and they create shanty towns in the desert. And now that we have uh, sent the best camps and of our army and establish them in the heart of the Negev, there are a lot of 
clashes and conflicts and cases of theft of protection money even to the citizens of the, of the suburb of Beersheba. This is a very young population, about 56%, 56% of the Bedouins in the Negev are less than 17 years old, 56%. On the other hand, uh, people who are older than 65, you want to imagine, 2% older than 65. There are many who still marry three or four women. We know it, we can't do anything about it. And in several times, leaders of Israel tried to solve the problem to have the Bedouins settle down, stop their nomadic life when you meet them all over the place. Uh, Sharon wanted to, he had a wonderful plan of several cities, towns and villages. And he said, that is going to be the places where the Bedouins are going to live. He said that, but it didn't happen. So today, when we speak about the Negev and we speak about diversity, we have also to take into account that we have to find a solution which will allow the Bedouins in the Negev to live, let's say, a full life, life with their full rights, life where they can really uh, find enough employment. Today, there are more than 10% who are unemployed in the Negev. And you know, this population is doubling every 16 years. So in 16 years, we're going to have 600,000 Bedouins. And that's extremely important to solve these problems and to find a way, a way of coexistence between Jews and Arabs and Bedouins in the Negev. There are also Bedouins in Galilee, but this is for another story, another meeting. Now, uh, I don't want to speak to you all the time about the Bedouins and about Ben Gurion. I want to speak to you about these fantastic guys who are here. I think that those of you who were last time at our meeting, perhaps they caught a glimpse of my dear friend, Professor Novak, who spoke very shortly, but he succeeded to conquer our hearts with this story. So I want to pass the torch to Victor Novak on one condition, Victor. I want you to tell us about your research, but I want you to tell us about your life and about the way you reach the point where you are today, because this is fascinating. And you are a people's person. I know that you have a story. I want to hear it from you again. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me in uh, uh, this meeting. It's, it's a pleasure and uh, honor to be with you guys. Um, I probably would start uh, as I started last time. You, you can hear that my accent is different from the usual Israeli accent. And uh, uh, I'm from Russia. I was born in Moscow and uh, raised in a typical Jewish family. I didn't play piano, uh, but uh, I did ballroom dancing. So it counts in the Russian community as being similar. Uh, and then at age 19, I decided that uh, it's time for me to make Aliyah. And actually, I came here uh, alone. My family stayed uh, uh, behind. And uh, after a year uh, building houses in Beersheba, I used to work for a construction uh, crew. I uh, was admitted to the medical school here uh, in Beersheba. Why Beersheba and why uh, from Moscow to Beersheba? That's, that's uh, a long story, but um, uh, since uh, 1990, I'm here and I love this place. Uh, and uh, during these years, I, I not only graduated from our medical school here at Beersheba, I did my residency uh, here in an internship. I did my military service uh, in uh, Nahal Brigade. It's one of the infantry brigade for five years. I was a m medical doctor. And then I raised my family here. Uh, in parallel, um, I did my research training and uh, uh, had wonderful teachers uh, here at Beersheba. One of them was Professor Birk in genetics. 
uh, and then we moved to Boston, and uh, uh, I'm still faculty uh, at one of the hospitals in Boston, actually, at Israel Dickens Medical Center. That was the first hospital in Harvard system to admit Jews as a, a residence uh, in training. And uh, maybe some of you are familiar with this wonderful book, House of God, that describes this, uh, this, uh, uh, this time. Uh, and uh, I used to work uh, in this system and we used to live in Boston, but uh, as they say, my heart was here in the desert. And so uh, after a few years, uh, I was called back and I, I gladly came back. And here we established uh, uh, a research center, which uh, had a slightly different idea. Of course, I do some of my research programs, but uh, what I actually do, we are building a research infrastructure. Um, uh, we are building this infrastructure because we fully believe that uh, it is not only about Zionism uh, to be here in, in Beersheba, it's also because of the potential that we have here. And if up until maybe three, four, five years ago, I would say, well, I'm here because of the Zionism, uh, and, but Boston, after all, it's somewhat greener, better, uh, and maybe snowy place than Beersheba. Right now, I can tell you fully that uh, it's to pl the, pl the place to be if you want to develop your scientific career. And this is because we have some features that they are unique uh, to our region. Well, first of all, uh, it is our population. Uh, we have a very diverse population. And so uh, what we'll, we'll, we'll talk extensively, I believe, about, about this, what you can do uh, and how this can be useful not only for us here, but the lessons that we learn and our discoveries are, are most relevant to our neighbors and uh, uh, to the whole world. The second one it is our climate. If we believe in climate change, and um, I would say that we all believe now uh, in the climate change, uh, we uh, can actually at Beersheba uh, advance the science and understanding how this hot climate that probably will be in the near future in some other places that right now are less hot or less dusty than Beersheba, how this affects now the human health. And actually we uh, are those to develop uh, the ways how you can mitigate the effect of the climate. And I'm talking about building the cities in the desert and I'm talking about new advances that will be not only uh, energy saving and green, but also will help to prevent uh, the negative effect of the heat. So how can you live in this environment? This is like a time machine. You can learn here now what others will probably uh, know uh, in 20, 30 or 50 years. Mikhail, you're, you're, you're on mute. So if you, you wanted to ask something, sorry. Yes, give us an example. What is, is the, the desert gaining on Beersheba? What kind of diseases can emerge from this uh, desertation, desertification, which happens in the entire world? And what can you and your friends contribute to stop that? Right, so, um, you know, uh, every development starts from understanding what you're dealing with. And so uh, this unique combination of uh, this climate, and this is severe desert climate. Sorok is a desert hospital on one hand, but on the other hand, we have uh, a full range of the medical data and we have Western type medicine and we know everything what happens with our patient from cradle to, 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 uh, to death, just because the system is so, so uh, unified and we have our computer databases going back almost 30 years already. So this unique combination of a uh, harsh climate and data uh, helps us to advance our understanding how this can help uh, our population. Well, first of all, this notion, uh, what happens to the immigrants that they come uh, like me, like myself, they yeah. are coming to hard environment. Well, uh, it would be uh, uh, maybe somewhat expected, but you would expect a higher rate of uh, renal diseases because our kidneys are not that happy when you move from a very cold climate and humid climate into a very, very dry climate. And so we, we studied that and we know that uh, uh, Olim Hadashim, the new immigrants, uh, they have 10 times higher chances of suffering from stones in their kidneys. And so here you can intervene and you can educate uh, the newcomers 
about uh, hydration process and about um, uh, different other uh, strategies. Uh, you can also look on some other uh, interesting stuff. For example, we looked into the effect of Ramadan, the holy month of Ramadan that is right now, where maybe, uh, as you know, uh, uh, our Bedouins or Muslims are, are uh, fasting between uh, during the daylight. And so apparently Ramadan has some effects on your health as well. And again, it's, it's funny, but only us can actually study that just because we have this combination of readily available data and, uh, and uh, uh, this type of population and side by side Jewish population that can be compared to that. And also we studied the effect of dust storms that are so frequent in our, in our area. How does this affect not only your lungs, but also your, uh, your heart and so on and so forth. And right now we are making consortium actually with uh, industry and uh, with our uh, neighborhood countries uh, that uh, actually uh, will be focused in something that we call desert tech. How do you develop different strategies, including strategies in health, how you can mitigate and minimize the effect of this climate here. So is that, all, your, is that your research today? Well, part of my research, part of our research programs, and we have a wonderful team here, uh, actually led by my wife. So it's very convenient <laughs> because we keep everything in house. Uh, so, uh, and we do do, of course, research on the dust and, and the climate effect on, on the human health. I think that the actually, and maybe that would be one of the last thing that uh, I would share with you that the real answer will be probably in combination of the research between the genetics, between the environmental effect and between different other exposures uh, during the human life. And uh, uh, when we will be able to incorporate the genetics and environmental data and the clinical data into one, um, one uh, database and when we can uh, deliver and practice truly personalized medicine, I think that would be a solution and probably we are in the negative, are in best position to do that just because we have this unique health system. Thank you so very much. That's very interesting and very practical actually. Uh, now you said that you were a pianist for a while. And no, our, I, I, did, I did ballroom you dancing. The piano. You played the piano, you did not become professional. It, it's like me, like I, I also did. I also had this kind of parents and this kind of piano and this kind of future. But anyway, uh, music is also part of the hobbies or perhaps a very important part of the life of our next guest, of Professor Oad Birk. I think that uh, you are also a composer, Professor Birk. Is that yes, true? Uh, yes, but I probably made a good choice. And well, <laughs> no, I, I don't sing. That's I, I've done a great favor to humanity by not singing. Uh, but otherwise, my music is fine. But anyway, I have to tell you something about this guy. Professor Burke is the son of a professor, of a father professor, and a mother professor. Okay. His brother, Professor Burke, another professor whom I know very well. His wife is also a professor. So I've never seen, seen that this kind of, of commando of professors who have went into different directions, but they have also always the same base. So Professor Berg, without further ado, please tell us about your research and about what you're doing. Okay, I will start talking just like that and then maybe share a screen with you. And so one is in Be'er Sheva and Be'er Sheva is uh, Soroka and Soroka is uh, the only medical center for about a million people. The million people are about 800,000 Jews and about 300,000, 250,000 Bedouins. The Jews are uh, quite diverse. So there are uh, Moroccan Jews, uh, North African Jews, let's say. Uh, there are Ethiopian Jews. There are two communities of Indian Jews. There's the Bnei Israel, which came from Mumbai. All the names end with Ker. Negauker, Ker. If you have a Ker at the end, you're from Mumbai. 
And then there is the Kuchin Jews that are a, a totally different community. And then of course there are Iranian Jews and all sorts of other groups. Um, I will share the screen with you for a moment. Let's see if it works. Can you work? Can you see? Yes. Good. Okay, one second. Okay. So um, no one works alone. That's the team in the Genetics Institute. These are different ages of my research team. The guy here visiting us is Marshall Nirenberg, Nobel Prize for the Genetic Code. The guy visiting here is Morris Kahn, two very dear people that were conducive to much of our, well, helped us a lot. Anyway, so you, you, you're in the Negev and you have these communities and you want to do good. And, and these communities have uh, diseases and especially the Bedouin community, okay? So the Bedouin community, about 60% marry their first cousins, about 80% marry within tribes. And what happens is that you have a lot, a lot of diseases. 20% of the men have more than one wife. So it might be, for example, we discovered a muscle disease in a 60 year old and I talked to him and then, oh, wait a minute, he has three wives, he has 23 children. And of course, think of how many grandchildren he has. And that's by the age of 60. So it's, it's a very uh, complex and inbred society. And then there are the uh, Jewish community. You know, when, when Ashkenazi Jews were always sick, they always had genetic diseases, right? We all know of Tay-Zaks and this sort of thing. But Moroccan Jews, Iraqi Jews never have diseases, right? So, so, and actually they do, only it wasn't researched, it wasn't talked about, and the diseases were there to be found. So, so actually we, we, I'll mention later on that the most common uh, hereditary diseases in Iraqi Jews and in Moroccan Jews, similar to Tay-Zaks and Ashkenazi Jews were discovered in my lab in Be'er Sheva. So, so there, there is a lot to be found. And then a few words about our Bedouin community. So the Bedouin community actually um, emerged from five to 300 years ago, main, main mostly, though some came 100 years ago. When you look back, more than 50% of this community actually came from the Gulf region, from Saudi Arabia, from the Emirates. They didn't know, they had no idea there's going to be oil. So they migrated and they came to the Negev. And then in 48, many ran away and few stayed and the few expanded dramatically with a very high growth rate. So you have what we call in genetics a bottleneck. And then you have, a, and they intermarry within the families, within the tribes. So you get a lot, a lot of what we call monogenic diseases, diseases that are caused because of a problems in a single gene. If you get two bad copies of the gene, you're sick. And of course, if you, the, the husband and wife are first cousins, the chances that they both carry the same bad copy from their common uh, grandfather or grandmother, uh, then the, the rate of these things is high. Uh, in the Negev, in Be'er Sheva, we built a huge operation. So we do the computation, we do the human genetics, we do the models for, we can do a mouse model for a disease, we can do a fly model, we can do a fish model, we can use, we can do a lot of biochemistry all in the same lab. Very rare to find such uh, operations anywhere in the world. And th this is a partial list of the diseases we discovered, totally new diseases not known to humanity. Some of them are local diseases, but quite a few are common throughout the Arab world and some are common throughout the Jewish world. And in fact, some are common throughout the world. So you start with local things and, and you work and you find things. Another thing, oh, I'll just give you a few examples. This is a, a disease very common in the air world. We discovered it, it's called infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy. Kids are born totally fine at about a year. They are fine, they start walking, talking. 
and by two years they're totally disconnected and, and and they are kept alive by their families but there's no connection they sit look at the healthy sibling and the two sick children and we showed that it is in fact very similar in concept to taste zax it's a storage disease so an enzyme in the brain does not work and it's supposed to take apart something and it doesn't take it apart. So this thing accumulates and by the age of two years, it accumulates so much in the brain cells that what you get is, is this horrible disease. Uh, this is a horrible disease I won't show you, but in diff eight different tribes, three different genes, and now actually both of these diseases are nearly gone. Okay, so when we discover a disease, we implement our findings in massive a massive operation. So we have the team of the research, we have the team of, of, of the clinic, and then we also have a team of nurses, about 10 Bedouin nurses going throughout the tribes and, and doing the tests and it goes to the Soroka and, and, we, and we call in the ones that are found to be carried. Professor Burke, I, I read somewhere that you succeeded to reduce the diseases of the uh, Sephardic Jews and of the Bedouins by 30%. So, so in, in Sephardic Jews, these two diseases are near are now gone. They, they are uh, one out of 40 uh, Sephardic Jews actually is a carrier of either PCCA or PCC. It's progressive cerebello, cerebral atrophy. One is born with a normal brain and it shrinks. And by the age of a year, it, it, you start deteriorating and it's a horrible disease. This is a similar disease, but totally different mechanism. We discovered both diseases. It went into what we call the basket of, of treatment in Israel. And now it's screened for, for all Sephardi Jews for free by the government. And these two diseases, again, one out of every 40 Iraqi or Moroccan Jews is a carrier for this disease and, and one out of every 40 Iraq, uh, Moroccan Jews is a carrier for this disease. Both are now going to be gone, okay, from 2011, it's in the screening program. Uh, in Ethiopian Jews, the first diseases, in Indian Jews, the first diseases, we just discovered uh, a disease, a severe eye disease in Iranian Jews. Uh, and, and, and it goes on and on. In, in Arabs, actually, in the Bedouin community, because of the screening program, together with other efforts of the ultrasound, any, the, the entire uh, hereditary part of, of things, we drove down by 30% uh, infant mortality rates. And, 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 and actually, when you took, talk to people in pediatrics, uh, some diseases are now gone, okay? And, and uh, another side, just one more word, is, is common diseases. Things like attention deficit hyperactivity, okay, disorder. Common throughout the world, right? Very hard to find the mechanism of that because it's a complex of an environment and many genes. Atrial fibrillation, the most common cause of human cardiac heart arrhythmia. Gout, the muscle problems in because of statins, statins for cholesterol, right? The most uh, 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 prescribed medication and about 10% have a muscle problem. All, all these things, their mechanisms, much of their mechanisms have been discovered in our lab through very unique families. So I, I'll give you an example for the ADHD, a Bedouin family, three kids, severe ADHD, they're moving around like crazy, but they're smart, they're fine otherwise. We discovered the gene. We generated mice with exactly the same mutation in the mouse gene. The mice run around like crazy, but because they're mice, we could study what's going on there in terms of biochemistry, in terms of the electrophysiology, what's going on in these brains. And now we have the entire mechanism and a mouse model for ADHD that one can now test new medications instead of going directly to humans. Atrial fibrillation. Oh, Professor again. Burke. Okay, so it goes on and on. Yeah, sorry. I have a question. I know that many of your, of your conclusions have been published in, in the most renowned medical journals in the world. But tell, give me an example, what you discovered about the Moroccan Jews, you said Moroccan and North African Jews in general, that these diseases are gone. Are they gone in Beersheba or also through, all throughout the country? 
So it's, it's a great joy to do, yeah, I'm a very active physician. I see patients every day and, and, and but I do research also every night. So, and, and the mix is great because you meet the family. So you meet the families that are in Be'er Sheva, but then actually the screening grow, goes throughout Israel and actually throughout Sephardi Jews anywhere because now it's, in the, in, in, it's on the list. And actually it goes on in future because take an example, uh, for example, Tezax, it's been tested for 40 years ago, but it's tested for now and also 40 years ago, for 40 years ahead, because, because these genetic diseases stay in the community and every generation you meet, need to check the couples so that not two carriers marry and they don't have a... Uh, so, so, so actually it affects here, it affects throughout the world. I get emails from anywhere in the world because the disease we discover, there are patients with that disease in other places that had no idea that's the disease, but now because we publish, they discover, oh, wait a minute, so that's what we have. And then, oh, wait, what's going on? Treatments, et cetera. So yes, it's, it's you sit in your small office in Be'er Sheva, end of the world, <laughs> Soroka, and like Victor said, you run the world. It, it's, it's amazing. It's, and, and really, I think it's a huge driving force for Israel, and actually, it's it's becoming a driving force uh, worldwide. It's extremely inspiring, I must tell you. Just try to think. Perhaps you remember. I say to our, uh, our uh, watchers and listeners. Perhaps you remember the photographs we showed at the beginning of Beersheba, the way it was in 1948, a kind of tiny lost town. Nobody knew about it in the Negev. And look today, these two, these two professors who told us what they're doing. And you see that suddenly this Beersheba and Soroka and the research at the University of Ben Gurion, they become a kind of beam, a kind of, a kind of, of, of uh, base for pride and for copying and for learning for the entire world. Which is exactly what, once again, my my mentor Ben Gurion used to say that he wanted Israel to become to become a light into the nations, and look what these people are doing. It's it's extremely inspiring. I cannot express it with words, but I believe that you agree with me. I, I, I want I want to say the, one more thing. The students we have are amazing, amazing especially, well, we deal a lot with the MD, PhD students, but I, I, every generation says, oh, they were, you know, we were, no, they are great. I, they work like crazy, they're bright. They, 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 we're also bringing up here an amazing generation. You they have to infect really us with your motivation. Okay. I believe yeah. that we had something which is just, Unbelievable, coming from these two professors. Now, I think that our viewers maybe will have questions or remarks, and let's give them the, the stage. Okay. Thank you all. It is uh, quite phenomenal what you're doing, um, and thank you for your service to um, the communities and to the world. So on that note, uh, Professor Ohad Burke, I have a question here. Um, do you get resistance from the Bedouin communities or other uh, communities to do your research? And um, a follow-up question from another participant is, if uh, people know within the community that marrying within the community creates so many diseases, what can we do to raise awareness? And uh, are they interested in um, educating their people and resolving it. Okay, so so uh, well, first of all, we do not do research on someone that does not come to us and wish us to do the research. Okay, so so uh, the families, in fact, are tremendously interested in what we do because they, they you know they, they marry their first cousin because that's the tradition, and then they everyone is brave when you don't have a very very sick child. Oh, well managed things will be fine. Uh, but after you have a tremendously sick child, who, and I'm talking about, you saw, I gave you just two pictures, but these are horrific diseases. 
then they want a solution. They, they are worried. They, they, they want to have more kids, but they, they know there is a risk. And if there is a way of avoiding it, they're there. So, so the answer is that they are at least as interested as we are, okay? And in fact, if they're not interested, we're overflowing with work. So uh, there's, okay, so, so there's no need. Uh, regarding education, so we run uh, our genetic counselors, we have some Bedouins on the team and, and they go throughout the high schools to uh, the last two years of high school. We try to reach a, a, a situation where no high school graduate has not had one or two hours with one of our genetic counselors in Arabic, in their school about uh, and now we get the religious leaders involved very much, okay, because it's a very religious society. And, and actually, we bring religious leaders to the high schools with us. And we had in Ahva, which is a college uh, nearby where there are about eight to hundred to a thousand Bedouin students that are mostly studying teaching. So, so these are not only young, married people are going to be married, but they are the future teachers. And last year we had a, a huge operation of, of seven half days with our genetic counselors. I did the opening in 10 minutes in Hebrew and then moved to Arabic for the rest of the five hours. It, religious leaders came in and said, yo, well, you know, Muhammad had uh, so-and-so wives, but he said one of them was a cousin, but he preached to marry outside. Okay, so, so okay. Yes. and then genetic testing is fine. And in fact, by Muslim mm -hmm. law, you can, the soul goes into the body only at 120 days of, uh, of pregnancy. So you can actually do testing and actually have that. That is the only religion that allows you to have abortions, even the very, very religious. Uh, and, and we set the program so that we reach by 120 days, by three months, we, we, we actually have the answer for them. Uh, we're moving now to, to, to IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, so there's no need for abortions. And, and, and so, so it's a very integrated uh, thing with the community. And you slowly, slowly, it's a social thing, okay, you slowly see less cousin marriages. But it's slow. And you don't fight it, you don't preach against it, you say, look, it's your choice, you decide, but you should know this is the risk. And if you marry a fourth cousin, then you still stay in the family, but the risk is lesser. So maybe that's a good solution. And actually when I was on BBC World and, and uh, on uh, the Doha debates, it's, uh, it, it was in Qatar, uh, it, it was 400 students from all over the Arab world, very similar questions, very similar problems. And, and now with the Emirates, what the, it, it's very interesting. It's the same genetic, same everything, and, and, and we're beginning to sort our way with them also. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Yes, Professor Berzara, did you? <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you, you have okay. further questions. There is a live question here from a participant for uh, Professor Victor Novak. Um, can you please uh, speak uh, briefly about your cannabis uh, research, cannabis research uh, that you are doing and that's going on in Soroka? As you know, now it's a time of uh, legalization of that um, in uh, certain parts of America and others in the world. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, is there anything that's groundbreaking or we should know that's going on in, in Soroka? It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic uh, because um, uh, as you know well, uh, it is almost impossible to do research in the United States, uh, at least not on federal level, uh, into medical cannabis. And that's why Israel uh, was a pioneer, actually. Uh, Professor Michelon was the one who discovered the receptors in, uh, in our bodies. And uh, he discovered uh, how cannabis affects uh, our bodies. And apparently we do have receptors in our body cannabis-like uh, uh, chemicals. And so the question was uh, about maybe five to six years ago. Uh, okay, so what do we know about the effect of cannabis on, on, uh, on human health? And apparently we don't know much even now, uh, meaning that uh, there are not a lot of uh, quality research uh, into this question just because of the limitations 
uh, regulatory limitations, so on and so forth. But people are still using it. And so we decided that uh, we need to give our patients the answers. Who can use it? How will it help? And first of all, uh, uh, can it do any harm? So our research program started from uh, actually uh, uh, making collaboration with uh, some of the companies that were pioneers in, uh, in uh, developing medical cannabis uh, pill. Uh, and uh, we actually published quite a lot of work and uh, some of our treatment protocols are now kind of a standard treatment protocols uh, within, uh, with, with medical cannabis. Just uh, to give the flavor, we were the first to publish, uh, to publish an actual research how cannabis affects uh, elderly. It's not so elderly, but people, folks about, above age of 65. Um, is it any harm of using cannabis with uh, medications that usually use in this uh, uh, age? How does it affect uh, uh, your mood disorders? How does it affect uh, uh, people or patients with fibromyalgia? Uh, and recently we also published or did a research on uh, how does it affect your blood pressure? Because uh, we were very concerned that uh, cannabis treatment can be associated with uh, cardiovascular effects, and especially with the high blood pressure. Well, and apparently cannabis uh, can actually reduce your blood pressure but I wouldn't recommend to use it as a blood pressure medication yet uh, and certainly be, be uh, very cautious about using it with other blood lowering medications. So uh, we were quite active and still are active in this, uh, in this field. We have uh, many collaborators in, uh, in uh, North America and uh, in Australia as well. Um, and uh, again, I would stop short from recommending everybody on the call uh, go smoke it right now. Uh, it's probably <laughs> won't be won't be that good. But uh, if you do that for medical reasons, uh, look for what uh, we found. Also, Novak, I heard that it is also has been tested and had very good results about epileptics. Yes, that's true. Yes. That's true. It's not done by us, uh, but actually uh, there are two pediatric symptoms uh, where cannabis, uh, CBD, part of the cannabis, not psychoactive uh, part of the cannabis, is approved by FDA for treatment of uh, pediatric type of epilepsy. And uh, uh, we have some results also in Israel that were uh, published from, from researchers uh, from, uh, from Jerusalem. Indeed, uh, it has a great promise uh, and we would love to see more research done in, in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to share a picture with you. And it is the picture of the new research. It's a plan, okay, of the new research innovation center in Soroka Medical Center. As I, we understand, it's starting being built now. Uh, this month. Yes, yes, this month. So it's very exciting. We want to hear from both of you, starting with Professor Novak and then Professor Burke. Um, the impact of what's going to go on in this building on three levels, on the Negev population level, on Israel level strategically, and the global impact. So if you can be brief, we have like 12 more minutes, but um, we'll start with you, Victor. Why don't you tell us briefly about um, this exciting Innovation Research Center and its potential impact? Right. So first and foremost, it is called uh, André Delroy Soroka BGU uh, Medical Research Institute. It's a long name, but it signifies uh, a lot for us. First of all, it is a collaboration between our university and us. Uh, second, it is on Soroka campus, and this is the first time there is a dedicated building, dedicated for research building, built in our, in our campus. Uh, and third, we, we are proud that uh, we were chosen by uh, Adelis Foundation uh, for uh, this huge support uh, to help us and build this, this amazing building. I hope that it will look like that, especially the trees. I love the trees. Uh, I doubt though that it would look like that. Uh, we still have some troubles with trees here in Beersheba. But the goal of this building and this institute, it is to bring together researchers uh, from the university 
and uh, physicians uh, like uh, Professor Wad Birk, like myself from Soroka um, under one roof uh, and actually also to bring their uh, industry uh, to support the innovation that uh, we all are thinking about. Part of this building will be dedicated to this uh, Negev Biobank that it, this is a relatively new initiative uh, of us uh, that um, uh, actually it's one of the first population banking uh, in Israel and in terms of the um, uh, uh, width of uh, collection of the different tissues, uh, cultures and uh, blood cells and whatnot, it's probably one of the largest right now. And uh, we hope that this biobank uh, together with all other research teams at Soroka uh, will bring us to a new level. Um, for us, it's also very important uh, to provide our young physicians, young and ambitious physicians and very smart physicians. And again, I'm very proud like Oad uh, in this new generation, uh, both of us uh, probably share the same view on our MD, PhD students uh, who are fantastic, just fantastic. And, uh, and uh, uh, they're so smart. Uh, and uh, I think that we need to provide this uh, for them, that this infrastructure that uh, will be comparable, if not better than anything that we have in central of Israel. Thank you. Uh, Professor Burke, would you like to add about the impact of research that's been and going to be conducted in Soroka? Uh, it, it, it's moving ahead and it's uh, this concept of MD-PhDs is, is moving ahead throughout the country, throughout the world, and the integration of the medicine and the research, it's very interesting. It, it generates a very different type of researchers that know the medicine and know what questions to ask and where to go in the research. It also generates a very interesting and I think better version of physicians that not only know things, but also think. Uh, not that I'm, uh, in research, you don't take things as given, okay? In medicine, usually you do. And, and, and the training of the MD-PhD puts a question, it makes you, it trains your brain to think about everything rather than just know. And the medical solutions that emerge with the mix and, and this whole uh, operation that Victor leads in, in, with this building, it's not the building, it's, it's the uh, concept behind it and, and what it's going to uh, bring with it for the coming generations. Not, not in the 50 years, in three, four years, okay? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's really nice and, and tremendously important. Y you know, Be'er Sheva is remote, but it's the center. It's the center of Israel, right? Look at the map. True. Sure. <laughs> and, 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 and it is the center. It, you know, it, it's been done for cyber, and we're seeing now, you know, the next step was bio and bio, bio research, and, it, and it's happening. It's happening and it's wonderful and we're in a great era. And whoever wants to join in time, that's the time before it, one cannot, uh, it's too late. <laughs> you won't be able to buy an apartment in Bel Sheva. So that <laughs> takes me to the next question about collaboration and partnerships, not only the fabulous synergy between uh, Soroka and Ben Gurion University, but also around the world. Um, what can we do as uh, your um, advocates, partners, and supporters, and what can other uh, collaborators do from around the world to help support you and what you do um, uh, at Soroka and Ben Gurion University? What can we do? Well, well, there is the research side and there is the medical side and, and they integrate. And when, see, when if you have a funnel with a lot of research, you end up with a lot of medical solutions. But the medical system is not structured to have great leaps in short times. For example, in genetics, with all our discoveries, oh, wait a minute, when I see my clinical genetics institute, a lot of tools are missing, a lot of uh, you know, th things, be because if we've made a huge leap in the research 
uh, tenfold and, and, and the clinical setup is, has grown by 20%, then you're, okay, so, so yes, there is a lot of need, a lot of need. And then uh, uh, of course, uh, and the research is endless. So it's a mix, both in the medical side and in the research, uh, there's so much to be done and so much to, to be part of our, uh, we welcome people and we welcome, not, not donors, we welcome people who want to join in the same venture, okay? <laughs> that, uh, being, doing together, being part of the story, being helpful and, and, and doing things together, joined. That, that's actually the way we, we go and that's the way we want to go and we're, everyone is, we will be tremendously glad. Thank you very much, Professor Burke. We do feel like one big family. And uh, Professor Novak, did you want to add anything? How is collaboration and partnership uh, significant for what you do? Yeah, I, I, think that the I think that the focus should be on our young uh, physicians and young researchers. And actually anything that can help to educate them, to provide for them competitive environment uh, to nurture them uh, and to be um, uh, attractive enough in Soroka to bring them back from uh, uh, America, from Canada, from Europe, uh, that would be tremendous uh, for us. So um, uh, go around, folks, and see if we can send our bright people uh, for training in the best centers uh, uh, where you are. If you can support them being there, that would be tremendous for us. We were less uh, interested in, in money for buildings. We are, we are more about people around, uh, around here. It's very, very important for us. Okay, so this, this, is, a very, yeah, this is a very Zionist conclusion to our meeting, yes. I think, to bring them back, to make them work here. They are great and we want them back home. That's true. Uh, there's the walk in the walk, as we say. Uh, before we conclude with one personal question, I want to ask something that came up here in um, um, a, a person asked in the registration form uh, of uh, Professor Burke. How does your uh, research support um, people, children and adults with uh, HD, ADHD? And there is there different uh, genes for ADD and ADHD, and does it different between cultures? And since it's a very common disease, as you said, and um, uh, recently has been more diagnosed and talked about on, for all ages, how uh, does your research support that? Yeah. Okay. So, so well, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is what we call the hyperactive kids. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's a mix, okay? There's environment, there's genetics. The, the genetics are complicated and the environment is complicated and, and, and it's not a single entity, okay? So, so it's a big mix. We know of common mechanisms such as dopaminergic things in the brain or you know, they're very specific things that are shared by many of them. What we have discovered is a, a specific pathway that is beyond that. Uh, I think the greatest implication of our work would be, it's soon to be published, but no, not yet, and, but it's finalized. And, and, and the main thing would be a mouse model, which would be very helpful because when you try medications, you really don't want to start with humans, okay? You want to have uh, ways of testing things and, 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 uh, and of course, we are pushing also the understanding of the mechanism. It's not that we do things and tomorrow there is a medication, here's a drug and you know, it, 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 science is uh, complex and lengthy. But uh, yes, we are pushing things and we're a thing, there are things where we are driving already to medications. In fact, we, we have one drug on the way that's really oh, seems to be working. So, so uh, Um, can I tell a story, short story? Of course. Two families, Victor was here, so the student was a Russian Jewish guy in my lab. And, and uh, 
two families came in with a muscle disease severe. One was an Ethiopian Jewish disease uh, uh, family, two kids, uh, both very sick, near death. Bedouin family also had two kids, both actually died of this muscle disease. And this student in my lab, this I was working on the Ethiopian family and then when the Bedouin family came in and said it must be the same disease. And I told him he was totally crazy because no way, there are so many muscle diseases and these are Ethiopian Jews and these are Bedouins that originated from Egypt and you know, no way. The end point is that he, after three years of hard work, he proved that actually it's a new disease, identical disease. In fact, he showed that the Ethiopian Jewish family and this Bedouin Arab family from Egypt are, uh, have a shared ancestry probably 800 years ago or, or so. And, and they share the same mutation from the same founder, uh, merchants probably from Egypt to Ethiopia or back uh, met each mm -hmm. other. And, and, you know, and, and the end of the story, and it's a true story, the, both families decided not to have kids anymore because they knew they had this risk and no way of testing it. And, and, and the end of the story is that the Ethiopian family had the IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis with their L and they have a child and they're healthy and, and the Bedouin family had their chorionic villi assembly. They, they can have testing and, you know, and, and the child was tested and, and, and they have also a child. And actually the families met. And so, so you know, you start with, uh, and, and we had frogs experiments to prove that and, and a lot of biology and new biology that we discovered through that. You know, but a single of one of the many, many, many projects in the lab and just how it, it's a mix of the biology, the human, the Arab, the Jewish, the mix, the, it's a crazy place. It's a wonderful place to be. You know, we're at the end of the world and we're its center, not only the center of Israel, but the center of everything. And, and, uh, I think we're doing good work, but we need, it, it's a nice mix because it's not, it's not a place that's going down, you know, it's a place going up. And, 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 and you know, if you want to invest time, invest whatever, you, you want to do it where it's still needed and yet where it's going to flourish. And, and, and I think we, we Bail Shiva represents Soroka and, and PGU, you know, that, that's what's going on. So before we end with uh, Professor Barzoar saying the final words, we want to thank you very much, Professor Oad Burke and Professor Victor Novak. And we, on that note that you just said that wonderful touching story about also um, Be'er Sheva and the Negev region going up, I'd like to share with you a very short, less than one minute uh, video clip from the mayor of Be'er Sheva, Rubik, Rubik that, um, that shared with us especially, and very proud of all of you. אנחנו יכולים להתגאות יחד. זה שהפכנו את באר שבע, שהייתה פעם עיר עם סטיגמה בסוף העולם, עיר של גמלים, העיר שהמדבר שולט בה, אנחנו יכולים לומר היום בגאון, שבאר שבע הפכה להיות מרכז העולם של סייבר, חדשנות וחולמים, Oh, sorry, it jumped a little bit. Let's Cyber, חדשנות ומחקר. אנחנו יודעים לומר שבאר שבע היא היום על המפה הלאומית של מדינת ישראל שקולטת את יחידות האלית של מעבר צהל דרומה. בבאר שבע יש את רוב החדשנות הראשון מסוגו במדינת ישראל. ובבאר שבע יש את האנשים הכי טובים. עם הלב החם, אבל גם אלה שחולמים, מדמיינים. So I think in this uh, very uh, happy note that Be'er Sheva is first and foremost its people, Professor Barzoar, I must tell you. Say to wrap up this uh, very uh, exciting you. and touching session. With people like Oad, Victor, and Rubik, the mayor of Be'er Sheva, and with this motivation, with this enthusiasm, with this decision to go ahead and to do it, I think you must be an example to the entire state of Israel. 
we should not forget 65% of our territory is the Negev, is the desert. And we thought about camels and how to work in the wilderness. We never expected Beersheba and you guys to be such people and to give an example to every young Israeli and to show us why it was so important to come back to our cradle to Israel and to do this kind of wonderful things. Thank you very much, my friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, visit us again, participate again in um, the May 12th, the future of the Negev, uh, fourth and final episode of this wonderful series. Thank you, Professor Barzar and our distinguished guests. Thank you, Rachel and the board. Toda Raba and have a lovely rest of the week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Shalom. Bye. Shalom. <laughs>